Louisiana, a land rich in history and resources, originally the home of the Natchez, the Homa, and the Choctaw, but the adopted home of Iberville, Bienville, and Tonti. Louisiana, the focus of international struggle and intrigue for centuries, a place of mystique, the home of a people known for distinct culture and institutions, the parish, the police jury. Louisiana, that catalyst for transforming the form of British North American colonists into a national melting pot. Louisiana, the birthplace of jazz, the refinement of blues and the gospel, the source of Creole and Cajun food, the home of Huey Long and Evangeline, Lee Armstrong and Marie Laveau. The Louisiana Purchase, arguably the world's most significant real estate transaction, will be the subject of this semester-long series, both on its immediate importance for its continuing impact today. Hello, welcome to week 12 in our series on Louisiana Purchase. This is the second to last lecture which will be given by Dr. Connie Z. Atkinson, Associate Director of the Ethel and Herman Mitlow Center for New Orleans Studies. Dr. Atkinson holds a PhD from the University of Liverpool in Liverpool, England. As I mentioned earlier, this lecture series grew out of a suggestion made by Dr. Atkinson. She's an authority on New Orleans music and regularly teaches a course on the history of New Orleans music. In her lecture, she traces the development of the strong musical tradition in New Orleans and the impact it had on the struggle for control of the local culture soon after the purchase. Atkinson discusses the tales of conflict between locals and the incoming Americans at the time of the purchase, but concludes that the evidence shows the times were actually more outrageous than the tales. So far in this excellent series, we've learned about the various political and economic factors associated with the purchase, in this hour, we'll look at the city of New Orleans and its cultural life and the adjustments to that life when New Orleans became part of the United States. When people study cities, they often look at the government or the economy, but you can learn a lot from looking at the cultural activities of a place. That's especially true of a city like New Orleans, where the political and economic structure often has been shaped by the social and cultural history. In looking at the dancing and social activities of New Orleans, for instance, not only could much be learned about music's role in producing society, but also wider patterns of social fragmentation and reassembly. These patterns may help to explain how this community has embraced change and contradiction, promoting a flexibility that perhaps has contributed to the survival and durability of its complex cultural activities. Through looking at music, it's possible to trace the interplay of ethnicity and class relations in New Orleans that might be left out of other accounts. The conflicts over dancing in New Orleans point out how the values of New Orleanians differed from those of the incoming Americans, and on occasion the Spanish and French authorities, not just in their cultural choices, but also in their contrasting attitudes towards society and race. Looking at how activities associated with dancing and music were negotiated with the various colonial governments and incoming American officials can give some insights into how the city has held on to its distinctive culture while much of the rest of the country has been overridden by the Anglo culture of the United States, factors that affect the evolution of the city in the past and continue to affect the contemporary city. As a seaport, frontier market town, provincial capital and military center, New Orleans had a population that was always diverse and contentious. Descriptions of the city around the time of the purchase vary widely, reflecting national bias, moral outrage, or the loyalty of the local citizens. Spanish Governor Gayoso founded a gay city, ready and eager at the first excuse to attend masked balls and operas. The French prefect, Pierre Lassat, observed social and cultural life is as developed here as it is in Paris. The people are far more frank, docile, and sincere than in Europe. There is a great deal of social life, elegance, and good breeding. But New Orleans' first bishop disagreed. Arriving in July 1795, he found the moral climate of Louisiana completely depraved. Prostitution, adultery, miscegenation, and riotous living are common, he said, and impudent and sacrilegious songs are being sung at the dinner table. Thomas Jefferson had great hopes for the city. He wrote, The position of New Orleans certainly destines it to be the greatest city the world has ever seen. 
Bergouin du Vaillant noted its variety. I dare say that there are few places in the world where one might see the human species so diversified in nations, races, and colors as at New Orleans. It is really an original spectacle and one that seems to be reserved for this little corner of the world. But however the inhabitants and the city were described, eventually it would be mentioned that New Orleans was a place where music reigned. The late historian Henry Kamen wrote that early New Orleans deserved study because of the astonishing amount of music that was made here. Barring the music of the continent's indigenous peoples, New Orleans has one of the longest histories of musical activity in North America, both popular and classical, sacred and secular. The city's passion for dancing and opera, its role as a leader in the production of sheet music, publishing and composing, as well as the vast amount of musical activity in homes, on the streets and in concerts, gave New Orleans a reputation as a musical capital early in its history. Parades, dances, balls, and funerals accompanied by music have been practically daily occurrences from the city's earliest days, much of it taking place out of doors and available to people of all classes, enslaved and free. So when did this passion for music begin? The earliest settlers of the colony were principally concerned with survival, from plagues, hurricanes, political plots, and financial disasters. But as soon as New Orleans got on its feet, it began to move those feet in dancing. This was not rare for frontier towns. Even in the Protestant frontier villages of the West, dancing, perhaps surprisingly, was accepted and encouraged. You didn't need much for a dance, just a fiddler in a cleared space. However, all evidence points to the conclusion that in New Orleans, dancing was embraced as nowhere else in the land. Yes, all frontier towns danced, but like most activities associated with New Orleans, here it was carried to excess. Why did dancing become so popular? Well, for a far-flung colony, made up of immigrants from many cultures, where a variety of languages was spoken, a dance was an activity in which all could participate. Whether you spoke French, Spanish, German, the different African languages, English, all that, dancing was an amusement that didn't involve conversation. Predominantly Catholic, without Puritan censure, the particular intrusive population was another factor in the popularity of dance. The French settlers brought with them their love and knowledge of dances, as did the Spanish and the West Africans. But whatever the nascence of the city's passion for dancing and balls, the enthusiasm did not wane as the century progressed. For about six months of the year, it was the major social activity and therefore, its patterns and customs became woven into the social fabric of the city. Visitors, particularly from the Northeast, often were appalled at the energy and organization that were put into this sinful activity. The seeds of the tradition of the balls probably were planted in the colony around the 1740s with the French colonial governor, the Marquis de Vaudreuil. The young Canadian brought with him good taste, elegant manners, and a fondness for grand entertainments. Enthusiasm for dance continued to grow during the Spanish period of 1763 to 1803. By the time the American governor, W.C.C. Claiborne, arrived in 1804, this passion for entertainment had become so entrenched that Claiborne had been shocked at finding in the city young people who had no accomplishments but dancing with elegance and ease to recommend them. New Orleanians, no doubt, would have denied that they needed any other. And the youth of the city were not the only ones dancing with elegance and ease. Just before the Louisiana Purchase, a recent immigrant to New Orleans from the United States said, The Creoles love pleasure and dissipation. Both sexes throughout the colony have a particular passion for dancing. This fondness for dance is indulged in from adolescence to old age. Nearly every traveler who visited New Orleans in the late 1700s and early 1800s commented on the passion this city had for dancing, and often the comments were disparaging. Du Vaillant, a critic of the city's people and culture, said in 1802, they dance in the city, they dance in the country, they dance everywhere, if not with much grace, at least with great ardor. This ardor for dancing is carried to incredible excess, he said. Neither the severity of the cold nor the oppression of the heat ever restrains them from this amusement, 
which usually commences early in the evening and is seldom suspended till late the next morning. Perrin de Locke said about New Orleans, more than in Europe do they give themselves to pleasure with excess. The Creole women love excessively to dance and give themselves up to it without reserve when the occasion offers. Gay, noisy, hospitable, and easy to govern, the Creole could use more education and modify his passions. This observation that New Orleanians were easy to govern may have been underestimating the will of the locals when their culture was threatened. Much of the description of the balls seen in historical texts are referring to the public ones, but many of the balls required, at least provisionally, an invitation. Dances and balls were given to in private homes for a variety of reasons, to celebrate events or just for the pleasure of dancing. Larger private balls were held in public buildings, often to celebrate a particular occasion. The series of balls and celebrations in December 1803 that attended the ceding of Louisiana from Spain to France and then, 20 days later, from France to the United States is a spectacular example of the kinds of entertainment. On December 1st, the new French prefect gave a ball in honor of the French flag with a dinner, a concert, the ball, and then a late supper. The dancing was still going on at 7 in the morning. A week later, the Spanish governor, not to be outdone, gave a ball in return, this time lasting 12 hours, with the dancers leaving at 8 a.m. A week later, the French returned the honor with another 12-hour ball, this time upping the ante by adding eight gaming tables and serving tea, chocolate, coffee, consomme, and gumbo. This ball finally ended at 8 a.m. Four days later, on December 20th, as the Americans took possession, there was a grand private ball honoring them and the occasion with over a thousand guests. This beautiful dress was worn by one of the guests that night, the Marquise de Moran. And here she is in her ball gown. Another type of private ball were the subscription or society balls. These work like season tickets. Generally, a subscription would grant admission to six to ten balls for the price of between nine and twenty dollars, sometimes much more. Usually, each man could bring three women on his ticket. Although these subscription balls were supposed to be exclusive, often just the price of admission at the door would get you in. Public balls, those arranged by promoters for profit, have been going on since at least 1780s in various locations. We know that in 1787, Spanish Governor Miro, who by the way took great interest in music during his tenure, invited a group of Choctaw chiefs to a public ball to their mutual delight. On October 4, 1792, the first public ballroom devoted exclusively to dancing opened in New Orleans. The Condé Street Ballroom, now Charters, was a one-story wooden building, just 80 feet by 30 feet, a plain building, simple and unadorned, but New Orleans loved it. After 1800, ballrooms became more and more grand, even by European standards. By 1820, when the population of the city was only 10,000, it had eight ballrooms with capacities of over 500 people. During the next 50 years, Henry Kamen found 80 identifiable locations for dancing, plus dozens of unnamed taverns and cabarets. The Orleans had opened in 1817 and ruled as the best until the St. Charles opened in 1837 and then the St. Louis reigned from 1838. The number of people who went to the balls was astonishing. There were often 500 people at the balls and sometimes as many as a thousand, all dancing for often seven or eight hours. People seem to be willing to put up with anything to get to the balls. There are descriptions of ladies in their fine silk gowns walking through knee-deep mud to the balls. Footpaths, baths were furnished at the door. What kind of dances were performed at these balls? New Orleanians preferred a wide range of dances, which changed often with the fashion, but the most popular consisted of those such as the quadrille, that required intricate steps with groups of dancers forming a set and moving in and out of figures. Other popular dances were the gavotte, Marie Antoinette's favorite dance. The minuet, which meant small steps, of course, took three months to learn. The mazurka was beautiful but very difficult. 
and of course the contra dances, very lively, the simple dance that gave birth to the quadrille. To teach them, of course, there were many advertisements in the local paper for dance masters, some straight from Paris. A feature of these dances is that a dancer is constantly exchanging partners. In 1835, an Englishman commented, Orleanians are the best dancers in the United States. Mask balls were particularly popular, coming into fashion during the Spanish colonial period, 1763 to 1803. They were a thrill. The mask allowed all levels of society to dance together, broadening the range of permissible partners. The exchange of partners inherent in many favorite local dances meant that dancers were often partnered with strangers. With the mask, the stranger was even more of an adventure. The mask ball particularly shocked New Englanders and other Americans with its potential blurring of social distinctions and is the most mentioned of any feature of the balls by visitors and social commentators. As early as 1781, the Spanish colonial government discovering that slaves and free people of color were attending the mask balls, banned masking to these groups. In the 1790s, all masking was outlawed by the Spanish. In 1806, under the American government, a city ordinance also was passed banning mask balls. But after repeated attempts by locals to get them restored, in 1828, mask balls were again allowed, and from then until the mid-1840s, mask balls were wildly popular, predominantly in the Creole First Municipality. Promoters of the balls were constantly looking for an edge to attract audiences. New dances just in from Paris were an attraction, as were visiting musicians. One clever promoter in 1822 advertised that laughing gas would be distributed to all attendees as long as it lasted. Revealing something of the social hierarchy of the period, the gas was given out in this order, gentle people first, then people of color, then Indians. Another successful gimmick were the tricolor balls of Monsieur Coquet that began around 1799. He had obtained permission from the city council to hold dances open to free people, no matter their race, at his St. Philip Street Ballroom in exchange for his support for the city's failing theater. The agreement included an assurance that he would screen his clientele and limit the balls to Sunday evenings. But despite the agreement, evidence suggests that Coquet's Hall always had slaves illegally in attendance. The Spanish authorities, fearing slave revolts, were worried about slaves and free people of color socializing together. The Attorney General petitioned the council to cancel Coquet's permit, but Coquet countered with a threat to remove his support for the theater. A compromise was reached in 1800, and he was allowed to continue his tricolor balls if he would agree to stop admitting slaves and if he would eliminate gambling. Soon after, Coquet offered balls for the battalions of free people of color to cheer them after their battles against the Indians at Fort Apache. The quadroon ball was the brainchild of Monsieur Tessier, an actor with the New Orleans Opera Company, who rented Coquet's Hall for the 1805 season. Tessier advertised the first official quadroon ball in November 1805. These balls would be held twice weekly, exclusively for free women of color and white men. In addition, Tessier offered food, wine, carriages, and would rent out the ballroom for special events. The quadroon balls were hugely popular. Coquet continued the lucrative practice when he resumed ownership of his ballroom. Soon, other promoters added quadroon balls as an attraction. These were by no means the only balls available to people of color, and the discrepancy between municipal regulations and the degree to which they were ignored makes the participation of people of color more widespread than legend has it. From early times, there were formal balls for free people of color, eventually with similar music and dancing as other formal balls. Whites regularly attended these balls, although their attendance was not always welcomed. And people of all ethnicities flaunted the civil ordinances limiting or prohibiting their attendance. And despite laws prohibiting them and regular crackdowns on the practice, there were always places, taverns, rooms, where enslaved New Orleanians could dance and gamble. 
The Bay newspaper reported not a street nor a corner can be passed without encountering taverns where people of color could dance. Ah, profit. Yes, despite the consistent repression of cultural activities directed against people of color, a mitigating circumstance was the profit, not just for the promoter of the dance, but for the city as well. The balls were a profitable enterprise that garnered taxes and circulated money throughout the town, and New Orleanians of color contributed to this entertainment industry. Black musicians played for all kinds of balls, from private parties to subscription dances, and were an exception to the rule of no black men being pre present at quadroon balls. One of the first orchestras to be described at a New Orleans ball in 1802 consisted of six black musicians. What was the quality of the music? Interestingly, there are few direct observations. In the early years, there's not much enthusiasm, but later the orchestras are called adequate, then spirited, and even excellent. The brass bands, called in 1838 by the Picune, perhaps unrivaled on this side of the Atlantic, began to come in from the streets into the ballroom early in the 19th century to augment the dance orchestras. As early as 1807, there's a record of a dancing master borrowing a military band to play for the waltzes. This proved so popular that he did it again a week later. From then on, the presence of a military band for waltzing was frequent and welcomed. So brass band instrumentalists had a long tradition in New Orleans of playing dance music as well as street parades, important when you think of how the music evolved. Fictional texts such as the uh, romantic novels of the late 19th century and Hollywood films have portrayed the balls of New Orleans as paragons of excellence and manners. Although many of the private balls may have been all restraint and sophistication held in private homes such as this, the public balls were often rough and melees were a part of the experience from the earliest days. Locals regretted the violence but seemed to be willing to risk it for their amusements. Maybe the danger added excitement to the entertainments. Proprietors passed rules against bringing canes, swords, and weapons inside the public ballrooms, asking that knives, pistols, and brass knuckles, derriere for dance hall clientele, be checked at the door. By the 1830s, it was common practice to search the dancers for concealed weapons. Even the posh Orleans Theater searched its patrons routinely. In 1802, the Spanish Attorney General tried to reduce violent crimes, thefts, fights, and killings by limiting by statute the number of small dance halls and taverns. But regardless of the regulations against dance halls, police seldom closed them. Despite the chance for violence and mayhem, the dances and balls were so important and so integral a part of the city's social life for people of all classes that there was always a jealous attitude about any threat to the custom. Yet at the same time, different national groups often brought their quarrels to the dance floor. All this was magnified at the time of the Louisiana Purchase. The conflict between the Creoles and the Americans during the 19th century for control of the city was a major force in the shaping of the character of New Orleans. But the conflict around the time of the purchase involved more players than these two groups. The city of New Orleans had become a prize, carved out by the French, handed over to the Spanish, who handed it back to the French, who, to the irritation of the Spanish, almost immediately and to their minds illegally, handed it over to the Americans, their upstart and aggressive neighbor. At the same time, France was at war with England, and the British were looking toward the mouth of the Mississippi with interest. And to confuse matters, this had not been the Catholic France of the Louis that had replaced Spain. This was a new, radical France that had closed the churches and guillotined the king and queen. A concordance between the Pope and Napoleon eventually recognized the revolution, 
But this was not your father's France, and some New Orleanians, including the Ursuline nuns, considered Lassat, the French prefect sent to govern Louisiana, a dangerous radical and revolutionary. Lassat, on the other hand, thought Napoleon had made a terrible mistake and that New Orleans would eventually return to France. So at the time of the purchase, you could say it was not so much a battle between the Creoles and the Americans as first a battle among representatives of three governments, the two old colonial governments, Spain and France, that wouldn't leave town, and the new American government that wanted to get on with the big struggle, making an American city out of a foreign population that Thomas Jefferson called as yet as incapable of self-government as children. Before, during, and after American Governor Claiborne's arrival, tensions in the city had threatened to explode into violence with international repercussions, and these problems were showing up at the public balls. New Orleanians were caught in the middle of this international tug of war and saw their beloved amusements threatened. They had demanded a pledge from Claiborne when he had arrived that contrary to rumors sweeping the town, the Americans were not going to close down the public ball establishments and he had given them that assurance, going so far as to attend the balls himself to show his good faith. In Claiborne's famous missive to Secretary of State James Madison concerning the problem of keeping order at the city's public balls, he apologized for calling Madison's attention to something that might seem frivolous. But he said, I do assure you, sir, they occupy much of the public mind and from them have proceeded the greatest embarrassments which have hitherto attended my administration. Yes, the Spanish officials may still be lingering in the city, perhaps musing that New Orleans as an American city might not be in their best interest. Yes, the French prefect and his soldiers were still in the city, and many New Orleanians continued to look to them and not the Americans for guidance. Yes, the British might be making plans to get the territory and in fact all of America back into their fold. Yes, the currency was no good, and their new governor could not even speak French. But what the locals were really worried about was any threat to the balls. The dance floor was the site where the different national groups, ethnic groups, political, social, economic groups came together. Ownership of the dance floor was ownership of the heart and soul of New Orleans. Newcomers often found themselves left out of not only the social situation, but also political and economic circles if they couldn't dance the complicated dances of New Orleans. So they attended and soon wanted to change the dances to fit their taste and dancing abilities and to put their nation's seal on the culture of the city. Actually, one of the most famous of these mix-ups occurred just before the Americans took over during the last months of the Spanish period, in 1802. In this battle for the dance floor, the Spanish governor's son instigated the incident. He couldn't dance the complicated French dances, so he demanded that English dances be played. At first, the orchestra, out of politeness, obliged, but with seven French quadrille figures already formed on the dance floor, and the dance already begun, he began to shout, English dances. The New Orleanians began to counter French quadrilles. Then the boy ordered the fiddlers to stop playing. A huge rumbling began and it looked like a full-scale riot was about to ensue. The Spanish officer in charge called in the Spanish guard to protect the young man. They came in with their bayonets fixed and with orders to fire if the assembly didn't disperse. At this point, the French gamblers rushed in from the gaming tables with their swords drawn to reinforce their dancing comrades. Grenadiers on one side, players and dancers on the other, at the point of coming to blows. Guns, bayonets, and sabers on one side, swords, benches, chairs on the other. And just as it looked like nothing could stop a deadly riot, the women began to faint. The Americans present, taking a neutral stance, carried the women from the field of battle. At the last moment, three young Frenchmen took command and begged for peace on behalf of the fair sex. A compromise was reached and once the women were located, the dancing began again. For New Orleanians, prestige came with dancing ability. The governor's son, frustrated at the inversion of hierarchy, had tried, unsuccessfully, to reinstate rank through manipulation and control of the dance floor. <laughs> When the Americans took over, these kinds of scenes became more common. 
As Claiborne wrote to James Madison, the public ballroom has been the theater of all the disorder. In an attempt to control potential trouble, the municipal council created new regulations. No, they didn't expel the Spanish and French. By ordinance, from now on, all orchestras would play two French quadrilles for every one English quadrille and one waltz, and this would be strictly observed. This compromise was unpopular with the locals, who complained that the continued attempt to force English dances on the balls were ruining the first season of dancing under the Americans. Several wars of esteem were held on the dance floor over the next few weeks, some ending in broken heads and bloody noses, some ending in arrests and early closings. One ball given for the new American governor ended in a contest of song, with the Americans' Hail Columbia being drowned out by a rousing version of Les Marseillais. In his private correspondence, Claiborne wrote that he believed the disturbances were the work of Lassat and other Frenchmen who wanted to disrupt American control. On the other hand, Lassat privately blamed the American leaders, claiming that they believed that until two or three Frenchmen are hanged, they will not rule this country. The American authorities saw in the treasured public balls of New Orleans the potential for trouble. The only way to stop it, they believed, was to institute control and separate the classes and groups, a strategy the Spanish had tried in earlier times. Over the next years, regulations limited the number of balls, placed guards at the halls, and restricted attendance. In an editorial, a local paper reminded the new government that even the most barbarous of conquerors paid outward respect to local customs. But soon, at least some Americans began to defend the New Orleans way of life. In 1835, a rumor spread across the city that some Americans were going to disrupt the St. Joseph's Day Ball at the Washington Ballroom. To forestall violence, the mayor ordered the ballroom closed and the ball canceled. A group of Americans published an appeal to the mayor and the Louisiana American that the ban be lifted, signing it, Americans, the Friends of Peace, and pledging that there would be no trouble. By 1836, a form of detente seems to have set in. The Bee of February of that year reported on a ball hosted by several young New Orleanians. Their surnames hint that perhaps the American and Creole groups were drawing together. Some of the hosts were Pili, Zachary, Soule, Lalandre, Matthews, Barrett, Richardson, and Pritchard. Being the principal site of social contact on a large scale for the Creoles and the newcomers of all different nationalities, the ballrooms had operated as much to promote a common merging as to promote clashes. But by the 1840s, a change was occurring in the character of the balls. Slowly, through American regulation and control, the subscription balls were becoming more exclusive, confined to the upper classes and forbidding the mixing of groups a foreshadowing of carnival elite crews that would emerge later. The public balls, in contrast, were becoming confined to the lower classes. This change, in part, reflected the changing nature of the city, which had grown in population from around 10,000 at the time of the purchase to 100,000 in 1840. Many of the new residents were working-class Americans who brought with them American ideas of race ethnicity and class segregation, overriding the easy movement between groups that had been a feature of New Orleans public culture. Randall Couch has pointed out that the popularity of mask balls, reintroduced in 1815 after being banned for almost 30 years, was a strategy by New Orleanians to retain in the city's public culture that penchant for social and spatial interaction to a degree that American authorities would tolerate nowhere else. Behind the mask, again, New Orleanians could freely mix, ignoring distinctions and classifications created and enforced from outside. In 1857, the Americans organized the mystic crew of Comus, and the institutionalization of Mardi Gras had begun. Not a single Creole was among the 12 founders of Comus. After 1840, Mardi Gras, like the city of New Orleans, was transformed from a promiscuous celebration for the French population only to a citywide celebration that more closely paralleled the biracial and class distinctions of the Americans. But though Mardi Gras was refigured to reflect a class hierarchy, coexisting was another 
more ancient impulse. Mapping a field of activity that runs the gamut from the elite to the neighborhood celebrations, with both informal and formal carnival organizations that cut across ethnic, gender, and class lines. And, like Rex, the powerless but ostentatious ruler of carnival, those who attempt the governance of New Orleans are annually acknowledged and generally ignored. In 1852, the American political faction beat out the Creoles and took control of the city government. In 1856, an ordinance was adopted making it unlawful to beat a drum, blow a horn, or sound a trumpet in the city, prohibiting public balls, dances, and entertainments without permission from the mayor. But it was too late. The pattern was set, and the flexibility and modification inherent in the cultural activities of New Orleans allowed many of these to survive when a more rigid set of rituals and customs may have fractured. When the pressures to stop certain traditions proved too strong, some went underground to emerge later as social aid and pleasure clubs, festivals, religious and family customs, neighborhood traditions, private organizations, and secret societies, many of which exist until this day. <laughs> 